Being ice guided by a goddess who gives you two angel girls as maid sounds like a good life, doesn't it? We kick things off with our hero looking completely bewildered as he has found himself in an unknown world all of a sudden. An open garden is in front of him, and he tries to figure what has happened, but then a cute and curvy babe calls out to him. We learn that our hero's name is Kosuka and the babe tells him that he is the Garden of Eternal Spring. He is shocked to learn that she knows his name and demands an explanation for all this. However, the curvy babe simply tells him that he can ask these questions to her master instead. For now, she offers him her hand and takes him to a very fancy mansion. After the duo enters the place, we see an even more beautiful girl who turns out to be the curvy babe's mistress. Her name is Azura, and the babe is her maid, whose name is revealed to be Elise. Elise tells Azura that she has brought the man she has been looking for all this time. Azura is pleased to see our hero in her presence, and she asks him to join her. Of course, he's a boy, so he won't say no to such a pretty girl. Azura asks him to take her hand, and he does as she wishes. Suddenly, he feels a giant wave of energy and wants to know what that was all about. Of course, Azura knows that he has a lot of questions, but first she wants to ask him an important question. She wants to hear what Kosuka had seen before coming into this new world, and it gets him thinking. It has to be before the time he met Elise, so Kosuka uses his brain and comes to a terrifying revelation. He realizes that he was hit by a car and his life was taken away from him, which Azura confirms rather calmly. She says that Kosuka is indeed no longer on Earth and is in some kind of afterlife right now. Azura is very chilled out about the whole thing and says that our hero has entered into a cycle of reincarnation. She even pours a cup of tea for him while she explains the whole thing, and it looks like Kosuka has been specially selected for this process. However, his soul seems to be unstable, and Azura had sensed it the moment our hero landed into her world. This was why she had sent Elise to go get him, and by touching his hand, Azura has now helped Kosuka's soul become stable for a bit while he's here. She mentions that she can't send him back to his original world as his life has ended there, but she can help him start a new life. For this, he has to choose between getting reincarnated or summoned. Basically, if he is reincarnated, then he can start fresh but will have no memory of what happened in his past life. If he gets summoned to another world, he will get to keep his memories and carry on however he would like to. Kosuka is surprised that Azura is giving him the option to choose, but he goes ahead anyway and decides to be summoned to another world, since he can at least keep his memories in this case. Azura is surprised to see how quickly Kosuka has made his decision, but he reasons that it would be a lot easier if he has all his knowledge from his previous life. After all, it would be a pain to learn every single skill again right from scratch. Azura sees that our hero is a smart boy and decides to grant his wish, but it will take some time for the summoning to be prepared. For now, Kosuka can stay at the Garden of Eternal Spring and he gladly accepts the offer. A week passes by and it's finally time for our hero to set out on his new journey. He dresses up like a proper knight and goes to meet Azura who is now going to have him summoned. Before he goes, she decides to give him a farewell gift and transfers some power into his left eye. However, she does not explain how it will work and leaves it up to Kosuka to figure that out. Of course, our hero is a bit puzzled by this decision, but Azura simply laughs and says that he has another task on his hand. It turns out that some other kind of activity is currently going on in Kosuka's summoning land so he will have to make an important decision upon reaching there. His future will be decided by this choice, so he will have to act carefully. It looks like Kosuka is ready for the challenge, so he thanks Azura and Elise for the pleasurable stay and the new life. With that, 
He bids the goddesses farewell and enters the new world. But things get interesting right from the start. As a matter of fact, it looks like our hero is in the middle of a sandstorm. As he struggles to make sense of the situation, Kosuka sees a couple of girls who are also stuck in the middle of the sandstorm. He wonders if these girls are humans, but figures that it can't be possible since this is not Earth. Things go from bad to worse as a giant black bear monster appears behind our hero and is about to attack him. Kosuka has no idea what to do, but then he hears his name from a distance and we see that the people who were in the sandstorm are actually two pretty girls with wings, which means that they're as good as angels. They also happen to be deadly as they attack the monster black bear together and defeat it with ease. Kosuka is amazed by their beauty as well as their skills, but things get stranger when they refer to him as their master and ask if he's okay. This is basically a dream come true for him, because two cute and curvy angel girls calling you master is like hitting the jackpot. Kosuka doesn't know what to say, but he does notice that he isn't injured. Despite this, one of the girls accuses the other one of being reckless in battle and states that Kosuka should not get injured. The other angel girl argues with her and says that she did no such thing, thus leading to some kind of heavenly cat fight. Things start to heat up between the girls, and Kosuka is already fighting hard to control his intrusive thoughts, so he decides to change the subject. He asks the angel girls why they called him master earlier, and it confuses them. They cutely rush to our hero and tell him that they were created by goddess Azura to assist him. Essentially, these angel girls are almost like his slaves and he is free to do what he wants with them. This makes Kosuka very happy and he calls Azura a very kind person for the gifts she has sent his way. Things are just starting for our hero as both the angel girls bow down to him and say that he needs to choose one of them to stay by his side. This is the only way they can begin their journey and it puts Kosuka in a tight spot. This looks like the choice that Azura was telling him about earlier, and he starts to think about who to choose. Both the girls are pretty and cute, plus they have good strength as well, so it's not like he can go wrong with either of them. However, Kosuka wants to have it all, so he tells the girls that he would much rather choose both of them. Our hero has a rather confident look on his face, and it turns out that he's made the right decision because both the girls are happy with his choice. They are ready to begin their journey with their new master, but first, they need to be named by him, so they ask him to do so. Kosuka gives it some thought and notices that the girls have blonde and silver hair. With that, he names them Kuhi and Mitsuki, and both the girls seem to be pleased with it. They offer their hands to Kosuka, almost as if they are giving him their blessings and they say that they will be in his care from this point forward. Our hero is already getting all kinds of shady thoughts, but he looks at the sweet, innocent faces of Kuhi and Mitsuki and changes his intentions. He thanks them for being by his side, and the trio is now ready to conquer the world. To kick things off, Kuhi harvests the body parts of the monster black bear they just ended because they can be sold for good money in the city. Kosuka comments that magic is very convenient to have in a place like this, and then he asks his angel girls about the cities in this world. Mitsuki says that they are currently in the central continent and the next city is going to be a considerable walk. Our hero learns that the demons are always stronger in the central areas, so the cities have all been made on the coasts. Keeping this in mind, Kosuka says that the first plan of action is to set up camp and look for some food. In order to do this quickly, Mitsuki suggests splitting up and immediately hugs her master. She says that she will go with him to find a place where they can spend the night together. Of course, Kuhi doesn't think it's fair, but Mitsuki did call it first, so she has the upper hand. Kosuka doesn't want another cat fight to break out, so he asks the girls to calm down for now. Sadly for him, 
These words don't work on the angel girls and they decide to face off against each other. Our hero has no idea what they're trying to do. But then we see both Kuhi and Mitsuki awakening their powers. A blast of energy follows, and it looks like Kuhi has won the battle, so she gets to be with her master. Kosuka says tough luck to Mitsuki and then he carries on with Kuhi. On their way, he asks her if there is any other kind of land in this world which is not a continent. However, Kuhi was not given this kind of knowledge, so it's just something that our hero will have to figure out on his own. It's time for Kosuka to think back to his time with Elise and Azura, and he remembers what they taught him about this new world. It happens to be flat, unlike Earth, but for some reason, the people here don't really talk about the boundaries. This leads Kosuka to suspect if there is something shady ahead of the boundaries. His train of thought is interrupted when Mitsuki comes back claiming that she has found some vehicles for our hero. However, these vehicles turn out to be overpowered dragons that are just as strong as they look. Kosuka panics upon seeing the beast, but both the angel girls think that dragons are the perfect choice when it comes to traveling in this world. Of course, he's used to cars and bikes from his world, but he just assumes that dragons are the norm over here. Mitsuki asks her master not to worry because the dragon has been tamed. However, she makes a shady look and says that she made sure of it, which leads both Kosuka and Kuhi to suspect her taming methods. It's time for flight, so Kosuka seats himself and gets ready to ride his first dragon. The angel girls ask him not to force the dragon into doing anything because it's going to do all the work for him. However, the dragon takes off rather quickly, and it leads Kosuka to scream out of fear. All seems well after a certain point of time, as he looks down and sees the world from the sky. He is amazed by his experience and even the dragon looks back at him to provide some reassurance. It turns out that the beast can actually understand what our hero is saying, and he confirms it as well. Kosuka can feel what the dragon is feeling, so it's almost as if they are connected now. The dragon keeps saying the word Ko, so Kosuka naturally assumes that it's what the dragon wants to be called. Meanwhile, the angel girls are surprised to see how well their master has gotten along with the dragon, even though it has been tamed. It's no doubt that Kosuka is not an ordinary person, and the girls believe that there's a lot more than meets the eye when it comes to him. All seems to be going well, but then we see Kosuka struggling with the dragon. There seems to be some kind of disruption, and the angel girls start to panic for their master. Kosuka explains that Ko is disturbed because he wanted to try strengthening their connection. Due to this, Kosuka tried to cut into their link and that is what has caused the disruption. Things are getting a bit too tough for our hero so he figures that he needs to fix the link between him and Ko. He tries to look for some kind of mutual connection and after a bit of a struggle all seems to be well again between him and Ko. Kosuka and the dragon smile at each other again and the angel girls are relieved as well. However, they are a bit taken aback to see what their master did in order to fix the link. As far as they know, there is no one who has been able to do such a thing. They already thought that this world was mysterious, and now with their master being so mysterious, it looks like he's going to teach them a lot of new things. There's been enough of talking now, so the girls tell Kosuka that it's time for them to eat. After a hearty meal and a good night's sleep, the team is ready to kick off a new day. Kuhi starts off by preparing the fur from the black bear monster she had defeated. This can actually fetch a good price in the market, so Kosuka is pleased with Kuhi's attitude. He even says that more bears should show up, so that they can hunt them down and sell more fur to the market. Kuhi doesn't seem surprised by Kosuka's behavior, and that's when he realizes that he might have overdone it. The main thing is that the team doesn't need to worry about money for now, so they head to town to finally begin their adventure. However, as they march towards the city, 
our hero starts to feel something in his left eye. It's the same eye which Azura had blessed with power, but it seems to be hurting Kosuka as he falls to the ground feeling weak. Kohi and Mitsuki rush to their master fearing the worst, but all seems to be fine as our hero wakes up next to Azura, who is looking even better now. She is pleased to see her boy toy again, but Kosuka wants to know what's going on. He's at the Garden of Eternal Spring again, so he wonders if he passed away one more time. Azura reassures him that he's alive, but the only thing is that his body wasn't being able to handle the burden of the soul, so she dragged him back here to help him escape the struggle. Kosuka has no idea what she's talking about, so she asks him to collect himself first, and then she will explain the whole thing. She says that she had given him some powers right before he left, but she did not expect him to use them so suddenly and recklessly. Kosuka doesn't get why she's calling him reckless, but then he wonders if his left eye has dangerous powers. Azura is not pleased to hear this, and she says that his powers would not feel dangerous if he knew how to use them normally. The goddess has a strong presence, so our hero instantly apologizes to her. He starts to think in his head and accuses Azura of being kind only for show, because she can be really mean to him. Of course, she is a goddess, which means that she can read his mind, and she makes this known to him. This puts our hero in a spot, but Azura goes on to further explain that when he used his left eye's power, he also ended up using a lot of the divine power that she had taught him when he was here. Kosuka is still not sure whether he actually used this power, but Azura says that he used as much of it as possible, and he should be treating the divine skills with more caution. To put it in simple words, our hero's body is not ready to handle such divine power, but it seems to have taken root in to some extent. Kosuka needs further explanation, so Azura says that he needs to let his divine power flow through his body little by little and not all at once. He should use a limiter in this case, as it will help him control his flow and also master his control over the divine power. Now, Azura decides to send our hero back to his angel girls, but first, she says that he needs to follow her instructions, otherwise it will not end well for him. With that, a beam of energy is unleashed, and we see Kosuka opening his eyes to Mitsuki's body. The angel girls were by his side this whole time, and they were scared for their master because he had suddenly fainted in front of them. Kosuka says that he wants to get up, but that seems to be a tough job because of Mitsuki's curvy body. Even Kuhi joins in and says that he should stay still for some time because his soul was away from his body for a while. She takes things a bit further and offers her own lap to Kosuka if he's a little uneasy with Mitsuki. We all know what this means, but Mitsuki isn't going to let Kuhi have all the fun. While the angel girls argue with each other, Kosuka realizes how he's been using his left eye's power. For now, he can identify the species of a plant just by looking at it, but the earlier incident must have had something to do with the dragon ride. This time though, he has used very little power to see the plant. But at the same time, he can't use any more of his skills. This means that a limiter has been put on our hero, so he tries to check his stats like in a video game. He can see all his details, but there's a question mark next to his race, which looks a bit shady. He wants to figure so many things out, but his angel girls say that it's time to leave. He checks out their stats as well, but it looks like he's more interested in their cute maid costumes. All three of them get on their dragons and fly away, and during the trip, our hero asks Mitsuki why she has the title of Kosuka's follower. She is a bit taken aback at first, but realizes that he has used his left eye's power for this. She says that it might be because he had named her and Kuhi, which seems like a possible answer. The city finally comes within sight, so the trio gets their dragons to land instantly. Of course, they will attract a lot of attention if they walk around with dragons. 
so Kosuka tells Ko and the others to wait for him. However, something else seems to be the matter as Mitsuki can sense a battle happening up ahead. It looks like the people under attack are facing an uphill task as the number of monsters is a lot more than the number of soldiers. Our hero obviously wants to help these people, so he asks the angel girls if they can hide their wings. They say yes, so he sends Mitsuki first to the battlefield and asks her to maintain her cover. Not a lot of time passes by, and it looks like she was able to save the soldiers all by herself. We can see them recovering from the battle and Kosuka decides to be on his way. But then one of the Sodders attacks him. Kuhi gets in the way and saves her master after which she engages in a brief battle with the soldier. It seems to be an intense fight at first, but Kuhi is an angel girl, so she defeats the bald man with ease. That's when Mitsuki comes in and tells the men to stop with the fighting. They are all in attention and refer to her with respect, probably because she saved all their lives. She apologizes to Kosuka for letting it get to this point, but he says it's fine. Now, the leader of the soldiers asks them all to step down. His name is revealed to be Schmidt Anarchy and these men are actually from a merchant company. Schmidt tells Kosuka that he is grateful to him for instructing Mitsuki to save him and his men. He wanted to reward Mitsuki for her actions, but she had asked him to speak to her master instead. Kosuka now has to demand a reward, but he didn't do this for that purpose. Even so, it's always better to make use of any chances that come his way, so he takes a look at Schmidt first. He looks like a smart man who is very calculative, so Kosuka decides to ask for two favors. First, he wants to ride the carriage with his girls till the town of Ryusen, and second, he wants Schmidt to buy all the material that he and the angel girls have collected till now. This is because he does not want people to start asking questions about how he was able to get so much fur from a monster bear. Schmidt is fine with these requests, but he does believe that he's turning out to be the one benefiting the most. Our hero simply says that he has no idea about the market price around here, so it gets Schmidt thinking. He wants to talk in detail with our hero, but he suggests doing it in the carriage because it's not safe to be outside right now. With that, the trio enters the carriage with Schmidt and his men and we learn that the bald man is called Goes. He is the leader of the soldiers, so Kosuka apologizes if he and his girls got in the way of his business. Goes is fine with it because his men get a fixed price anyway. Now, Schmidt would like to see what our hero has got for him because he wants to inspect the material. Kosuka asks Kuhi to remove the items, so she brings out the fur from the black bear monster. Schmidt is shocked upon seeing the magic box as well as the fur. Even Goes is unable to believe his eyes, so it leads Kosuka to ask them if these items are rare. Schmidt explains that the magic box is something that every merchant wants to get his hands on, and the fact that someone is able to defeat a black bear monster is more than enough to prove that they are a first-class adventurer. Kosuka knows that the bear in itself is not very tough, but you need to be strong to be able to reach where they are located. Schmidt asks if there is anything else apart from the fur, but our hero says he has nothing more. It's a pity for Schmidt, because the black bear's organs can be sold for making medicine. Even so, the fur is more than enough, so he offers two large coins for it. Goes goes mad after hearing this because one large coin is enough for him to live lavishly for a whole year. Schmidt says it's worth the price because the material can be sold for a lot of uses. The black bear's fur can be used to make armor for adventurers and even coats for noble women. Keeping that in mind, two large coins would be a good deal for him, especially since the material is in top condition. Kosuka starts to think, and Schmidt asks if something is the matter. That's when he becomes honest and reveals that he has more black bear fur with him. Both Schmidt and Goes are shocked and speechless by this revelation, and Kosuka shows them all the fur he has. 
Seeing this material and the angel girls with Kosuka makes Schmidt admit that he's actually a little jealous of our hero. The group reaches the town, and Schmidt says that the total value of the fur is 10 large coins, and he does not have that kind of cash on him right now. Kosuka is fine with that and says that he will collect the payment in the evening. That sounds good to Schmidt, so he offers to meet our hero at a fixed location later in the evening. Kosuka and his angels check into an inn and book a room which is rather lavish for them. The bed is nice and wide, so both Mitsuki and Kuhi hop in to enjoy the softness with each other. Our hero is a bit nervous because he was not expecting to share a room with his angel girls. On top of that, seeing Mitsuki and Kuhi like this makes his intrusive thoughts take over, and he has to control himself. The girls start to tease their master for being innocent, but he doesn't want to unleash the animal within. So he suggests going to the guild so that they can collect more information. Kuhi and Mitsuki find his behavior to be cute, so they agree to go to the guild with their master. Of course, it's important to learn the structure of this place, so our hero first finds out that there are two types of guilds. Private guilds are made up of multiple parties, but public guilds allow everyone to join them and get jobs. This town has a public guild, so that means Kosuka can enter it if he wants to become an adventurer. The pretty reception lady explains that multiple people can take the same job and can even form a party together. The limit on the number of people in a party is six, which means that Kosuka and his angels can add three more at best. However, each task comes with a rank and only people with the same rank can do those tasks. As of now, there are seven total ranks which start at F rank and go all the way up till SS rank. Kosuka completes all his formalities and is given an adventurer's card so that he can finally start taking tasks. The angel girls suggest taking a look at the task board to see what's up for grabs, and they can see a whole range of missions. There's a lot to choose from, so Kosuka suggests doing some preparation first and then coming back the next day. Mitsuki wants to act alone for a bit so that she can gather more information. So she asks her master if she can do that. He grants her the permission and then heads out with Kuhi. They go to meet Schmidt at the place where they had agreed to see each other in order to complete the bear fur transaction. The merchant is pleased to see Kosuka and asks him to come to the back room with him where they can do their business. Our hero gets all the coins and is happy to become rich. He also asks Schmidt if the market price of this world changes easily. It's a smart question, especially when you consider the world he has come from. Kuhi enjoys a tasty meal, and Schmidt says that it usually depends on the conditions and state of the city. He explains that the price will only collapse if a lot of the materials are brought in at once. In the case of the black bear fur, it is not every day that someone will come with so many units, so the price will remain the same. Even for items like medicinal herbs, it will take a lot of units for the price to fall. Kuhi continues to feast on the food, so Schmidt asks Kosuka if he wants to start a business. Our hero simply says that he was asking for general information because he doesn't want trouble for breaking the market. He knows that he can take down monsters easily, so it would be a problem for other merchants if he got into the game. Schmidt once again comments on how skilled Kosuka is, and he's also shocked to see how much food Kuhi can eat in one go. With that, our hero bids farewell to Schmidt and they decide to speak again whenever the need arises. Kosuka and Kuhi head back to the room feeling full of food, so our hero decides to organize everything that they've got. However, he gets hugged from behind by Mitsuki, who is back from her solo mission. Turns out that she was out drinking and is completely vulnerable right now. Kosuka is nervous about this, but she says that she wants him to give her a reward for being such a good girl. Things start to heat up a bit, and it looks like Kosuka might just give in to his intrusive thoughts. But then Kuhi stops Mitsuki from her flirting moves. She asks her not to do such lewd things with their master, 
but she's in too deep to stop now. She asks for a kiss at least, because what they're gonna do after this is gonna be even more amazing. Kuhi seems to be thinking the exact same thing as Mitsuki points it out. So our hero is at the mercy of his angel girls. He might not be able to control the beast any longer. But Kuhi even goes on to say that she would like to sleep together with her master. After all, it does make sense for the angel girls to give Kosuka some heaven on earth. With that, our hero puts on his bravest face and gets into bed with his two angels. They get into their spicy outfits and cozy up next to their lover boy, whose face says it all. Can only be assumed what kind of shady acts had followed after this moment. Two weeks pass by like this, and we can see Kosuka fighting a giant stone monster with his angels. The stone monster is about to launch an intense attack on him, so the girls ask him to watch out. However, Kosuka is able to dodge the attack with ease and even comments that this is way too basic for him. Mitsuki is quite impressed to see how fast her master has become, but at the same time, she wants to remind him that strength is of the essence. The finisher move comes from her as she destroys the stone monster with one simply kick. Kosuka is glad that he can count on his angel girls for such powers, and then we see Kuhi harvesting the parts of the monster. Now that the job is done, the team decides to go back to the guild so that they can file their report. The guild lady gives them a handsome reward for a job well done, and we also learn that Kosuka's party has reached rank D. He has named his party the Eternal Journey and decides to celebrate the achievement with his angel girls. Ghost happens to be here as well, and he talks to the team about their progress. Kuhi and Mitsuki don't think much of their achievement, but Ghost mentions that they're quite impressive. As a matter of fact, he wants to show his appreciation by telling the team that he is going to throw a party for them. Goes also promises to invite all the people he knows, so that tonight can be a night to remember. Kosuka is a bit neutral about this, but he allows Ghost to do what he wants. It's nighttime now and we are at a pub known as the Hammer Bar. Spirits are high as people are cheering for Kosuka and his angels. Goes even goes on to say that their progress is so fast that they might even be able to take the tower for themselves. Kosuka has no idea what he's talking about, so Goes explains that the central continent is run by seven towers. However, the tallest one of them all is the big boss whose orders are always final. Legend has it that the one who reaches the top of this tower is the one who owns it all. These are the words of the ancient ages, and even though some of the towers have been conquered, no one has been able to master the towers of the central continent. This gets Kosuka thinking, so he asks if anyone can own the towers privately. Goes explains that the towers are actually owned by the people, but if you can take over them, then you become like a king who rules over the kingdom. However, even the idea of getting near the tower is pretty difficult, so to conquer it is a whole other ball game. Of course, now the only thing that our hero can think of is the tower, and he takes it back to the bedroom as well. Kuhi and Mitsuki ask him if the tower is on his mind, but at the same time, the group needs to avoid attracting attention as their party only consists of three people. Despite this, Kosuka says that he can't just ignore the idea of owning a tower, and says that having it as a home base would be great. Our hero comes back to his senses and realizes that he would be taking a huge risk with this, because he can't just hope for Kuhi and Mitsuki to do all the heavy lifting. He asks the angels to forget about what he just said, but Mitsuki points out that he does wish to conquer the tower, so it becomes her business. Kosuka confirms that it is what he wants, so both the angel girls say that it is now their mission to help him achieve his dreams. They are ready to put in all their efforts to achieve this, and they start planning their strategy as well. Kuhi suggests going for the biggest out of the seven towers because that's the big boss of them all. The girls turn to their master and ask him if he's on board with this. 
He takes a moment to calm himself and think before making a decision, and then he thanks the angels for taking his side. He also wishes to conquer the tallest tower, so the team starts working on their grand plan. Ten days pass by like this and then the team sets out on their mission. They've taken the dragons along as well for this one, because it always helps to have overpowered beasts with you. Also, dragons are good for hunting, so the whole thing just makes a lot of sense in general. The team finally closes in on the tower, and they are amazed to see just how big it is. It's hard enough to believe that somebody was able to make such a tower, and then the team starts looking for the entrance. They spot it on a lower section, so Kosuka asks his angels to be careful at all times. The dragons land next to the entrance, and then the team heads in, but not before Kosuka says that it's fine to escape if the going gets tough. Ko also wants to join in on the fun, so he grabs Kosuka by his cape and asks if he can also come. Our hero has no problem with that, so the team heads inside. The entrance actually leads to a wide, open space and it shocks everyone. No matter how large the space might be, there still has to be a way to go to the top, and this is where the dragons come in handy once again. The team rides them all the way to the top and Kosuka spots something that has an odd mark. Everyone reaches this zone and they find a boulder with a strange engraving on it. There's a portal next to it, so our hero assumes that it's a teleportation zone to the second floor. The girls decide to check it out first for safety reasons, and Kosuka's guess turns out to be right. With that, all of the team members pass through the portal and reach the next floor. We see a skeleton man who is woken by the intruders, so he and his other men try to attack them. Luckily, since Kosuka and the girls have their own dragons, they manage to skip the fight and fly upstairs with ease. This actually turns out to be a huge boost for our hero, because he and the angel girls are able to reach the 40th floor without having to fight any ground monsters. Of course, when there are monsters to fight which can't be avoided by the dragons, Kosuka leaves it to Kuhi and Mitsuki to get the job done. These monsters don't seem to be very tough, because the girls are able to defeat them without any issues. Thanks to this, everyone is able to pass through right till the 92nd floor. However, once they reach this zone, Ko is able to sense something dangerous, and it happens to be a gigantic beast of a dragon. It doesn't make sense for the team to carry on with their own dragons from this point forward, so they decide to leave them behind for now. Kosuka tells Ko to wait here for him, and promises to come back as the owner of this tower. The dragon is happy to wait for his master and roars to let him know he's cheering them on. Of course, this is a tough mission and Kosuka worries that Mitsuki and Kuhi might have a hard time fighting the monsters on the upper floors. However, they are able to defeat the giant dragon monster without even breaking a sweat. So Kosuka figures he was worrying about nothing at all. This sequence goes on for a while as our team manages to get by all the floors without any hassles. Now, they finally reach the 100th floor and Kosuka opens up a door that leads to a mysterious space. Here, he finds three giant crystals floating in front of him and is almost blinded by the lights. As he tries to figure out what kind of place this is, we get to learn a little about the crystals. They are of three different types, with the godly crystal being the main one, followed by the holy crystal and the demonic crystal. It turns out that all the crystals are connected to each other on each of the floors of the tower. Kosuka seems to have figured out the mechanism of these crystals, but things get a lot more interesting for him and his angels. In a strange turn of events, the godly crystal starts talking and it takes all of us by surprise. The crystal says that the conquering of the tower has been completed, which means that our hero has achieved his dream. In order to become the owner of the tower, he just needs to touch a section below the godly crystal and it will be set. However, for those who do not want to rule the tower, 
they can escape through the teleportation door that is on the inside. This voice makes the angel girls think there is an enemy nearby, but Kosuka seems to recognize this voice as that of Azura. He decides to take a shot in the dark and calls out to the goddess, hoping to receive a response. Sadly for him, there is no answer, so he comes to the conclusion that Azura is not directly talking to him. The girls point towards a strange console and say that the voice was coming from there. This happens to be the management console of the whole tower, so our hero can simply issue his commands from here if he wants. The angel girls urge him to do this, so he proceeds to place his hand on the console. However, he stops right before doing this and it confuses the girls. They ask him why he's pausing, so he expresses his doubts. Basically, Kosuka doesn't know if it's right for him to manage the tower because it was Kuhi and Mitsuko who did all the hard work. He barely had to even lift a finger, so he's not sure if he should take all the credit. Mitsuki simply smiles and tells Kosuka that it's right for him to do this, because she and Kuhi are just his angel slaves. They do as he wishes and are here only to protect and serve him. She also says that she has no desire to become the manager, and neither does Kuhi, so the only logical choice would be for our hero to go ahead with it. Both the girls act cute and say that they only want their master to be the manager of the tower. They will not take no for an answer and push their lover boy towards the console. Now that he knows what he has to do, Kosuka places his hand on the console and a burst of energy is released. The crystals take note of this action and proceed to register Kosuka as the new manager of the tower. They also send this information out to the other towers, and a massive blast of energy is unleashed. It is so powerful that even the dragons look at it with admiration. Now that the process is complete, the console asks Kosuka to register himself as the ruler of this kingdom. He thinks for a bit before giving a name because he wants to have some kind of alter ego. After all, it's something that all the cool superheroes do as well, so Kosuka eventually goes ahead with the name Amamiya. With that, Kosuka is now officially the undisputed ruler of his new world. After a bit of configuration and setup work, it is time for our hero to be given a tutorial on the tower. He has to touch the management console to move forward, so he hits the button that says yes. In a hilarious turn of events, we learn that the tutorial was quite a bit for Kosuka and his angels, so they are quite relieved when it ends. Kosuka is very tired from this process, but Mitsuki asks him to give an order to see if he's got the hang of it. Our hero did take a lot of notes during the tutorial, so he decides to put them to use. Kuhi comes up with a good idea of remodeling the current floor, because it would make sense to liven up the place especially if they are all going to live here. In order to do that, Kosuka checks out the layout menu for the floor and chooses to add a few rooms. After a bit of work, he manages to sort out a nice sequence and the floor is looking much better now. The crystals shine bright like diamonds and declare that the rooms have been added to the floor. The girls step outside the control room to see if it's done, and are shocked to find the exact same layout in front of them. Kosuka starts to get the hang of it and plans out how he wants to use each of the rooms. He also wishes to add furniture and other items, so he lets the artist within him awaken. He's actually quite good at this, as the rooms look a lot better after his edits are implemented. The angels are amazed by his work because their room looks even better than the one that they were renting. Of course, Kosuka has to address the fact that there is still only one main bedroom. He asks the girls if they still want to do spicy things with him together, and they give him a smirk that reveals all their naughty intentions. Of course, he's still nervous because it takes a lot of work to keep angel girls happy and satisfied. Now that the kitchen is set, Mitsuki asks if they can sit down for some nice tea and sweets. The triple couple sits together and enjoys the refreshments, but Mitsuki asks how much power is left in the crystals. 
Kosuka says that he first wants to distribute the points that were given to him via these crystals. There are a lot of calculations to be made in order to understand this system, but the main point is that the trio has a lot of points still left to use. On top of that, there also seems to be some kind of exchange rate among the different power crystals. Kuhi says that even though there are a lot of points left to use, they might run out of them soon if they get too reckless. She does have a point, so she asks if the power of the crystals can be recharged. Luckily for everyone, Kosuka had made a note of this as well during the long tutorial. It turns out that the crystals can be recharged with the power of nature and its living beings that are living inside the tower. Holy and magic power can be collected once a day from the terrains located in each floor. The funny thing here is that you get more points if you end the living beings inside the tower, rather than wait for them to pass away from natural causes. Since the monsters on the lower floors fight with each other every day, the team can rest assured that they will get at least 100 divine points each day. The girls get excited upon hearing this since defeating monsters are less like their bread and butter now. Kuhi suggests summoning high-rank monsters like black bears, but Kosuka says that he hasn't reached that level yet. He then goes on to give an explanation where he makes the girls understand that there is a difference between divine power and holy power. So, even if the team were to defeat all the slimes in the lower floors, they still won't have enough divine power to summon a high-rank monster. It's also based on luck, because the number of slimes is not a fixed thing. Kosuka has to do some thinking of his own, and after a bit of careful consideration, he decides to use the summoning circle. The girls tell him that he just said it might not be worth the effort, but he explains that it can get better for them if they start to level up the tower. What this means is that if our hero and his angels can level up the tower, then they can configure a lot of other things as well. However, the exact method to raise the level of the tower was not mentioned, which means that Kosuka and his girls will have to solo it for now. Kuhi and Mitsuki both believe that they will just need to keep summoning and defeating monsters to increase the tower's level, but Kosuka finds that to be a waste of time. He says that they don't have to be the only ones entering the tower for this to happen. Basically, his plan is to set up portals at various floors and allow adventurers to go into these floors to fight the monsters. This way, the tower gets a level up and the adventurers will be doing the job for our hero. Of course, Kosuka is thinking of a lot of ideas, so he suggests even charging people money to use these portals. If all goes well, then they can also set up a town and an economy within the tower itself. This would be great to keep the tower active, and the triple couple can also enjoy their lives with ease. Mitsuki asks how they will be able to provide accommodation to all the people who will be coming here, but Kosuka has an answer to that as well. He is going to build some houses on the 5HT floor using divine power, and for the other houses, he can just tell the adventurers to do it for him. This will save on costs and still help the purpose. Mitsuki and Kuhi are impressed by their lover boy's smart tactics, and they offer to share some of the crystal's power so that they can summon monsters for him. After all, it's going to be a task for Kosuka to do so many things all by himself. Our hero sees sense in what his angel harem is saying so he decides to give them the leeway for summoning the monsters. With this, the managing of the tower has officially begun. The next day, we see a couple of adventurers named Ek and Wahid kneeling to Kosuka. Our hero has no idea as to why they are doing this, so he asks his girls what's going on. Mitsuki reveals that she has started her own classes regarding summoning and is educating all the adventurers to bow down to Kosuka since he is their superior. Our hero likes the sound of this and commends Mitsuki for a job well done. However, when it comes to the actual act of summoning in itself, the angels are facing some issues because they are not able to extract the true power of the crystals. 
There always happens to be some kind of wastage, so it just makes better sense to summon the powers using the management console. This is just more work for Kosuka, but he's fine with it since this was something he was intending to do right from the start. He wastes no time and gets the job done through the tower. We can see that the town on the fifth floor has been made already, and Kosuka wants to check it out once he's done with dinner. Kuhi asks if all is well. So Kosuka says that there are some monsters that are roaming around the town. He wants to take care of them in order to avoid any drama later on, which is fine, but Kuhi says that there won't be enough time to defeat them all. In addition, Mitsuki is taking Ek and Wahid back to town, so she won't be available either. Mitsuki explains that the new adventurers should be able to blend in well with the others and even lure other adventurers to the tower. Kasuka is fine with this, so he allows her to go. But before that, Mitsuki has a quick word with Kuhi. They whisper and do some girl talk which Kosuka is unable to decipher. It happens to be some kind of naughty talk because Kuhi starts blushing after it. Our hero seems to think that she has become mad at him. Mitsuki changes the subject and says that Ek and Wahid don't know if a lot of adventurers will come to the tower in its current state. The reason for this is that there are too many lower rank monsters, which means that high rank fighter would not want to waste their powers here. Of course, Kosuka would love to transfer the middle class monsters to the town, but that is going to cost him a lot of points, so he lets it be for now. Luckily for him, he is able to locate the transfer gates and simply decides to link the lower floors to the ones where there are higher level monsters. Things seem to working out well for our hero, and he even notices that he can cut off the power supply of the crystals to certain floors. He's done a lot of hard work, so he decides to take some rest in a hot bath. Everything is going great for Kosuka, and now they're going to get a whole lot better. Kuhi walks into the bathroom wrapped up in a towel, and it makes Kosuka go crazy. He offers to leave the bath, but she says that she wants to spend time with him. We learn that Mitsuki had told Kuhi that she won't be back for a while, so this is her chance to get some private time with her master. Intrusive thoughts take over Kosuka once again, so he tries to fight his urges and talks about dinner. However, Kuhi says that she is the dinner, which means there is no more holding back for our hero. Even Mitsuki can sense the unspeakable things that Kuhi and Kosuka are currently enjoying, and it all leads to one big happy explosion. Will our hero's life continue to be so perfect? Or will some kind of tragedy get in his way? Like, share, and subscribe if you like the story and want me to continue. Show this video some love and I'll upload the next part as soon as possible. Okay then, see you in the next one.